In our manifesto, we have to do something about the history of predatory lending in this country and what it means now, and we have to stop it going forward. Um, and that absolutely has to be in there. Um, I think so much of this country and its economy has been built on this idea of credit, um, of, of wealth, through home ownership, through owning stocks, through starting businesses, all things that have been denied black people. And so that we have to have direct pieces in the manifesto that address those issues. Welcome to Mentoring Kings. Where do we go from here? A look at social justice in America. My name is Ashley Harrington. I am the Federal Advocacy Director at the Center for Responsible Lending. Center for Responsible Lending is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and advocacy organization dedicated to ending predatory lending and helping families of color and people of color build wealth. As we all know, uh, Black families have been subject to centuries of racial oppression and exclusionary practices, which have led them, which have resulted in a really big, a really large racial wealth gap. So our work is really aimed at closing that wealth gap by ending predatory lending, pra 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 predatory lending practices. That is everything from ending subprime mortgages. So um, we were major, we were very active in the fight after the Great Recession to achieve the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Act um, and, and the construction of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, we have worked on everything from payday lending, um, ending those types of predatory products. From the very beginning, there have been policies that were aimed at helping white folks build wealth that black folks were explicitly excluded from. Um, that's everything from who could receive the GI Bill to the process of redlining, which was federally backed, which, which determined who could buy houses and where. Um, in this country, home ownership really has been the bedrock of how people build wealth and it's been a bedrock of our economy overall. So the fact that so many black folks have been cut out of that market when so many white folks have been in, led into that market and directly supported by the federal government has really led to, has really led to where we are now and, then, and the effects of that just keep compounding on each other. So redlining was the practice of specifically determining who could buy houses and where. So there were actual maps with neighborhoods, usually neighborhoods of color, where mortgages were not supposed to be originated. So black folks were not allowed to get houses simply by the nature of the neighborhood. So they were actually stopped from getting loans in those neighborhoods that were neighborhoods that were predominantly black neighborhoods and black folks could not get loans in the non red line neighborhoods. So this was a practice that really prevented black people from accessing home ownership, which again is the bedrock of the American dream. So we had the Fair Housing Act um, and it's been over 50 years since then. And what is really startling for, for many of us is that the home ownership rate for black people is actually the same or slightly less than depending on um, slightly less than the what the home ownership rate was before the passage of the Fair Housing Act, which was supposed to alleviate all these concerns. And since then, there have been another a number of other initiatives um, to help curb uh, discrimination in housing, from the disparate impact rule to the affirmatively, affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, all of which aimed at weeding out continued discrimination and putting an affirmative duty on states and cities to actually ensure that fair housing access is, 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 is actually there in their um, jurisdictions. And now what we're seeing currently is all of these things are being rolled back. Just a week ago, the disparate impact rule was rolled back. Just yesterday, the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule was rolled back by Secretary Carson at HUD. These are very concerning practices because we know that discrimination still exists. We know that there are issues in our lending market. We, we need to look no further than the home ownership rate and how low it is for black people to know that there are still issues when we know that there are so many black folks who are ready and able to be responsible homeowners and to be a part of that, that part of the American dream and who have been shut out. And so to see these rules being rolled back that so many folks at CRL and other groups, our civil rights partners have worked on is extremely disturbing, especially right now when we are in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic and economic recession, which is still just 10 years out from the last great recession, which we have yet to recover from. And so we're on the verge of seeing our communities even further decimated by this crisis and by the, and by the regulatory rollbacks that are being that are that are taking place even as we navigate all of the other pieces of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we really need people um, advocating at 
the state and federal level, making their voices heard, letting it know that, letting folks know that this is not okay. We need uh, people talking to their representatives, talking to regulators, submitting comments when comment periods are open on regulatory rollbacks. Every time a new rule is issued, um, there's actually a comment period um, and people can submit their concerns. And it doesn't have to be just from CRLs. It can be from actual people who are impacted and who care about the fact that the federal government is rolling back protections for people of color and people who are seeking um, uh, just financial, financial security options and the ability to build wealth. If you feel like you are, you are seeing these things firsthand, experiencing them, raising them with your state attorney general's office, raising them with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau so that we can begin to build that record. Um, but we need, we need more people raising their voice in general about these issues and let them know that we are watching and we see you and we know what you're trying to do. There are interest rates 300%, 400%, which puts people in a cycle of debt. We call it a debt trap because there's no way you can ever pay off this loan. That's actually the model of many of these lenders. They put you in a cycle of debt so that you have to keep on taking out another loan just to pay off the first loan and the fees associated with it. And they get that money from you because it's actually attached to your checking account. So we call the debt trap this, uh, the predatory lending model where People of color and low-income people are targeted with unaffordable and, and unaffordable loans with very abusive terms. So an, a, a loan that has triple-digit interest rates that um, is connected to uh, things that they can take away from you, to connect to your bank account. They have car title loans where they can actually take your car away from you. Um, with the subprime crisis, it was mortgages that they knew borrowers had no ability to repay because of the terms, or they had balloon payments at the end where your terms could actually explode, your interest rates could actually explode um, years later down the line. Um, acceleration clauses where if you miss one payment, your entire loan is due in full. I think of it like this, we're in a system in this country where we make poor people pay more for everything, including credit. And if you have to pay more for everything, including and especially credit, how do you ever get out of poverty? How do you ever get to the next level if you're constantly being forced to pay more the less that you make, the less resources that you have? What is most unfortunate about the payday lending model is not just that they target people of color, it's that in many cases, these are situations where some financial institutions have abandoned these communities. It is often that you go to communities of color where you will see a payday lender on every corner but won't, you can't find a bank in addition to not being able to find a grocery store. So we need to, so it makes it that much harder. But I think there are, from housing counselors to financial counselors to other people that can help navigate you through that, through that matrix. But the best way at the policy level that we fight for to limit these abuses is a rate cap. A 36% rate cap is what we advocate for at the federal level and what me, CRL and many other groups have been advocating for is a simple 36% rate cap. That's something that already exists for military um, members, but we want it for, we want it across the board. Um, if you are a lender and you can't make a profit or serve consumers at 36% rate cap, then you shouldn't be in the business. And there is something, there is something incredibly wrong with a lender that feels they have to charge over that. And there is an issue when we, when we allow the people who need credit the most and need help the most to only have access to triple digit interest rate loans when there are so many other ways that we could support them. I do think it's important that we talk to our children about loans. I think it's important we talk to our children about financial health. Um, it's every, everything from that debt trap to student loans when you're thinking about going to college to to, the, to all types of financial products. I think it's important that we have those conversations. Um, I think it's important that we look into the other resources that are available. There's absolutely a student debt crisis in America. We have topped 1.7 trillion. There are 45 million Americans with outstanding student debt. That is a problem. And it's particularly a problem for black folk. We are more likely to borrow to borrow more and to struggle in repayment. And all this goes back to the discrimination and the inability to build wealth because wealth is what people rely on, what white folks rely on when they get ready to send their kids to college. And when we don't have that wealth, we have to take out more debt. And think about this, again, if this is a situation where most people rely on their home equity to send their kids to college. And then after the great recession, when so much home equity was lost, and people still had to go to college. Meanwhile, there was less state aid. That was even more of a burden 
placed on, placed on people, particularly people of color and black people who lost the most in the Great Recession and had the least but going into the Great Recession to lose anyway. But then they lost the most and we've yet to get that back. And so we have just seen this crisis get worse and worse and rise and it's having a negative impact on, on black folk and it's an intergenerational issue. So I'm really concerned about it. And TRL's position is that we absolutely have to, we have to cancel at least some of the debt. We actually did a report last year with civil rights groups, NAACP, National Urban League, Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and Unidos US, where we found that even if you had canceled, even if you canceled just $10,000 per borrower, you would have a significant impact on those who are struggling the most. You would completely eliminate the debt of 61% of the people in default, 61% with just $10,000 of elimination. We have since called for even more of that, more than $10,000 because of the COVID crisis. So now we're calling for at least $20,000 of cancellation, recognizing that this is an unprecedented crisis that again is hurting people of color the most. And these are also the folks who are struggling the most with student debt, but something has got to be done with these balances. If we come out of this crisis and we and balances have not gone down, then we have a major problem because these are also the folks who you would want to buy houses and start businesses and save for retirement and start families. And they can't do that because student debt is dragging them down and weighing them down in a way that it shouldn't. So we advocate for that cancellation. We advocate for a reforming income-based repayment. And two in five people were seriously delinquent or in default before the crisis. 40% of the black folk who graduated, who were part of 2003, 2004 cohort had defaulted within 12 years up to 70% was already projected to default by 2024. And again, that was pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, we had a problem. And this is only going to be worse. And to act like it's not is completely missing the, missing the problem and also missing the impact that it's having. Again, not just on individuals and families, but this is an, an economic problem. There was a study that found that if all student debt were canceled, that meant um, a like 70, 70 to $108 billion would be re-injected into the economy every year for like 10 years. That's how, that's how tremendous an impact student debt cancellation would have. Now, again, our report looked at even just 10K and 20K and saw what an impact that, saw what an impact that would have. But I think it just goes to show that this is a problem that yes, disproportionately felt by black people and brown people, but this is everybody's problem at this point. 70% of the people who graduated in 2016, 70%, that's across all races and ethnicities, had student debt for an average of $30,000. It's just not the, it's just not our parents' day anymore. It's not our grandparents' day. It will absolutely take federal intervention and targeted efforts to close the racial wealth gap. We are very aware that the racial wealth gap is the product of federal policies and practices that have enabled white folks to build wealth and own property, start businesses, um, and really um, experience that American dream that have and have shut out black people and, and all people of color. So this is something that will it will actually take federal intervention, and it's the federal government's job because the federal government has created the racial wealth gap. It's, it's a system that they created from slavery to Jim Crow to redlining to the GI Bill to numerous other pieces of legislation and practices that were condoned to the fact that um, they have not funded institutions in Black communities the same to the fact that they have allowed institu uh, lending institutions to discriminate against, to get against Black people and to leave Black communities and to um, provide them to provide them with more expensive unaffordable credit to track like all of these things are part and parcel of the same system and the federal government in various ways has has been both active in creating this situation and also passive in allowing things to happen so because of that there absolutely has to be something done that is proactive to address the racial wealth gap and the federal government's role in creating it and allowing it to continue. We need the federal government to hold all of these lenders and lending institutions accountable. And that is, and that is everything from creating the rate cap we talked about to um, providing uh, down payment assistance and uh, mortgage and mortgage assistance and mortgage credit to black borrowers 
to entrepreneurship help, to student debt cancellation, to supporting HBCUs, to um, all of these things, access, just creating access to capital, credit, opportunity that is real and that is not, and that is actually meaningful and that will not hold people back, but push them forward. Thank you for tuning in to Mentoring Kings. Where do we go from here? To learn more about future episodes, visit www.mentoringking.com and join the conversation on social media by following and liking at Mentoring King on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.